This is West Head in Bacon Bay. Pittwater lies south, the Hawkesbury River west, and Brisbane Water is to the north. This is a rugged and active coastline. Great boulders rim its towering cliffs. Rock falls are common. It was also a major defence fortress during World War II. West Head was unusual in that its guns were mounted just above sea level, a mungin upon the fallen boulders because if they had been mounted on top of the cliffs they wouldn't have been able to depress sufficiently to engage. An enemy could have sailed right under them. We're tying up some loose ends in this film, trying to nail down details that are becoming ever more distant in time and memory, not to mention buried as well in this steep and active landscape. This footage, shot in 2014, is being published now in 2021, along with new material regarding the Pitwater anti-submarine boomnet and its defences. The primary role of West Head Battery was to deny Broken Bay and Pitwater to the enemy, specifically to prevent an attack on the Hawkesbury River Railway Bridge. The two 4.7 inch guns of the battery were sighted to dominate any engagement eastward of a line from West Head to Lion Island. These guns were installed and ready for action by autumn 1941. Following the declaration of war on Japan on the 7th of December 1941, a decision was taken to install anti-submarine boom nets at Sydney Harbour, Hawkesbury River and Pitwater. The Pitwater net was erected from Barra Joey to a point just north of Resolute Beach. It was in service by March 1942. A three-pounder gun was deployed here at the southern end of the boom in this bunker, which was just large enough to fit the gun, ammunition and a detachment of three. Commanded by a lieutenant and accommodated within the West Head living area, it was known as Broken Section. In another location, yeah, yeah. closer yeah. to the West Head lookout, Vic Ray and is looking for World War II weapons there. pits as shown on an old army map. So. We, we, we have a, a row, one, yeah. two, three, and there's yeah. possibly a fourth. Yeah. So what the, were they, there's corrugated iron, so it's they, they had overhead protection at some stage, or it might just be the edge that's been revetted. And be careful there's not a hole or a void underneath you there too. A bit of concrete stuck in underneath there. Yes, they've, they've shored up the edges with rock and rubble. Now the question is what type? Is it a company headquarter? Is it a mortar section? Uh, and that, that's the quandary because it shows up in an area where they have a, a symbol for mortars on their map but I wouldn't expect to see overhead protection on a mortar pit. <laughs> it would have had on the roof, couldn't it? <laughs> see, this one looks more like a mortar pit. It's about the right size for two blokes, a mortar. It, it was here to provide all-round protection. It could fire to the north, to the east, the west, and across over the hill onto the... Uh, southern side. Uh, the battery is in the northeast and this is behind them to stop infiltration um, so that if there's a target in any of the areas behind me or and over the hill they could provide fire for the machine gun positions that are located around the perimeter to prevent an attack from the back and then going forward and interfering with West Battery. So we're at West Head and we're looking down towards where the Red Hands track runs at the moment and that was the area in which battery accommodation was uh, located and uh, latrines and toilets and showers um, and further up along this ridge were defended areas in 1943 that were defended by the Garrison Company and down in that hollow was a place called Boulder Camp where the off-duty crews could uh, spend time relaxing. You can see how these levels of ground show some evidence of being flattened out and probably as part of the occupation. There's been something demolished here 
we've got uh, concrete that's been formed up with uh, aggregates that are common to the 1940s era and uh, this is roughly in the area where the ammunition store was. This platform is either the ammunition store or it's the OC garrisons and it's about uh, what 15 by 10 meters is all a concrete slab yep I think this was probably what's marked as OC garrison the officer commanding the garrison it would be the office for them his headquarters still concrete yep In the 1930s, Broken Bay was declared a bombing range. So the round that was found at uh, Lion Island may have been a 250 pound bomb oh, or something yeah, smaller. Yeah, yeah. And this was a, an area that would have been uh, part of the garrison battalion's responsibilities to mount coast watches, to provide early warning of shipping movements, and uh, also to back up the defence of the submarine net. John, the uh, timber insets, top and bottom, to mount the uh, windows, the shutters, and uh, reinforcing bar to anchor camouflage and to tie things down that might be needed. Interestingly enough though that the door is at the front facing the enemy which <laughs> which meant that it was never expected to have to fight from it because you want the door at the side or rear as an escape. On top of the roof of this uh of this um, observation post, there's a boulder which, mu which must weigh at least 10 tonnes, which has obviously come down since the, um, since the post was built. Well, today, Rowan, John and myself are heading down uh, the Resolute track where the members of Broken Section would have come each day as they changed over their details at the Three Pounders station north of Resolute Beach. They lived in the area out to my right and uh, it was called Boulder Camp originally but it became Broken Section Camp between January and December 1942. Once war was declared against Japan on the 7th of December 1941, the threat to Australia increased dramatically. Within three days, 18th Battalion moved Bren gun carriers onto Westhead to patrol the road networks. Two days later, Port Kembla, Sydney and Westhead were at alarm following sightings of an unidentified grey-hulled ship. It was feared that a raiding party, possibly landed from a submarine, might get into Cowan or Pitwater from where it could access Sydney and play merry havoc. We're approaching the broken section gun emplacement and its wharf remnants from the south, from Resolute Beach. It's very difficult going and it's tide dependent. This tilted arrangement of wharf piles looks like it may have been part of the pitwater boom net, but from here I simply can't get up to them. That looks to be the two rocks that supported the wharf that serviced the broken section. So I've just scrambled up here under the big rock. And as you can see, the tide's getting higher. We may not be able to walk out of here. And this is where we have to get up. There's the gun emplacement. Extraordinary. That's where we just come through, that gap there. And this is the rock. There's Palm Beach in the distance. And that has to be the foundation point for the wharf. It's about 1.5 metres long, 3 to 400 high, and 500 deep. These two concave forms must have held 
the bearings for the wharf. But interestingly, here's iron, and it looks like cable. And across in the other one, similarly, looks like iron. So it looks like the, oh, okay. Now right here is a large iron bolt very firmly secured into this very large rock with, with cement or concrete and I can see that if you line up the end of this thing here with the plinth and go in here that has to be the end of the cable that held the boom net that's it. It's been cut off there, but it was obviously secured to this big eyeball. And if you go over here, you can see the forms I've just described. There's Baron Joey in the background. And if we come down here, That's where the cable came in here. So it went right through to where the camera is. Right across the Baron Joey. In this shot, you should be able to see the plinth. And you can see on the left, the eye bolt fastened to the rock held the end of the boom cable. And you can see in the top of the frame, the gun emplacement that defended the net, a three pounder. This triangular engraving is an army survey point determined to a high standard of accuracy. It would have been created by the survey company attached to Sydney Coast Artillery and was used as a reference point to determine the coordinates to the gun centre, the searchlight and the observation post. This observation post allowed the uh, control of the gun that's down on the waterfront and the searchlight that is further up along the northern shore, to be able to observe across the boom net that was in place to prevent enemy craft going into pit water. During the time of the 1942s, when this was occupied, then there would not have been trees obscuring this area at the height that we have them today, and there would have been camouflage nets in front of this position to uh, stop observation from people out at sea. Going across there you can see the eye bolt. It must have secured the absolute end of the cable. But we do wonder if perhaps there wasn't a further bit of cable going up to these pylons up here as a second anchor point. Quite possibly. And there you have it, I'd call that departure rock. That's where all the men went for, were picked up by a ferry for R and R. They walked out across the wharf that ran from this plinth out to that rock and taken by ferry over to Palm Beach for R and R. So there's the eyeball in line with the plinth that the cable ran through and above it the observation post and in between you can see on a lot of white on the top of the rock and I think this must be where concrete was mixed or perhaps brought in and, and spilled on the rock for carrying up to build the gun emplacement and of course also to build the plinth. The wharf bearers stretch 20 metres from the plinth to the landing rock. These two excavations of the landing rock held them in place. You can also see an embedded green object immediately above the left excavation. It's a Royal Australian Navy hydrographic branch triangulation point, a trig point. I've come across from the landing rock and the gun emplacement 
struggling down this slope, it's pretty steep. So those pylons that are stuck in the rocks. And the first thing I see, apart from a lovely big bush spider in the middle of the shot, <laughs> which doesn't like me much, first thing I see, these pylons are embedded in concrete. It's not reinforced concrete. You can see there, there's no steel there. So these two piles will put in a natural hole in the rock and the whole lot was concreted in. It would have run through there to the concrete plinth and from there it ran all the way across and uh, In January 1942, two three-pounder guns were allocated to West Head, but only one was installed near Resolute Beach, where the net came ashore. This gun was probably operational by March 1942. It fired a 47mm solid steel round for piercing light armour or steel hulls. There was also a high explosive round. Standing only 43 inches high at the centre line of the barrel, the three pounder was compact and capable of firing 20 rounds a minute. Torturous Rick. Uh, well, this looks like the foundation. Yeah, exact size of that. For a uh, three pounder. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we'll find some leftover bits of retaining bolts. No, there's one with Looks good right there, doesn't it? Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten anchor points in its level position. It will clear this. But to depress and fire out towards the heads, they cut away the forward edge so, so that they could have depression and if necessary they could get elevation with the cutaway at the top and this just made it difficult for people to shoot into it. Okay, we're just scrambling out of here. So I've got a big heavy pack on my back. Try to put the cameras in gear. And I'll pull the camera out here because what I've stumbled on was this. It's an old eye bolt, and I can't see how it's fastened. It feels a bit flexible, like it's, like it's on a cable. This cable eye probably secured some sort of guideline for troops to transfer from the observation bunker that's directly above us down to the broken section gun emplacement that I've just left. Well, I don't think I was cut out for carrying a big pack. Good thing I wasn't in the army. I don't know how these bikes would have gone carrying 200 pound guns down there. They would stall down there. And of course, a bunch of men can do anything if they get organised. This bunker, the site of the three pounder, was built to provide splinter protection for broken section personnel. Fortunately, it was never fired on. War arrived in Australia from August 1940 with the sinking of a significant tonnage of East Coast shipping. The last days of 1941 saw Platoon 2 Garrison Battalion fully deployed at West Head, the guns ready and the shells fused. In February 1942, British forces, Australians among them, were comprehensively defeated at Singapore by the Japanese. By March, Broken Section was defending the boom net here at Resolute. General MacArthur and American troops arrived in Australia in that month too, just as Japanese troops landed in New Guinea. The Battle of the Coral Sea raged from the 4th to the 8th of May and on the last day of May, four Japanese submarines assembled just off Broken Bay launched midget submarines that attacked Sydney Harbour and breached its boom net defences. From June 4 to 7, the Battle of Midway saw devastating damage inflicted on the Japanese fleet and their aircraft carriers rendered irreparable. On June 8, Sydney and Newcastle were shelled by Japanese submarines and on July 8, there were submarine sightings in Broken Bay and at Cowan. But tensions were subsiding, so much so 
the broken Section 3 powder was withdrawn in December 1942. The year-long emergency was over. Pitwater's anti-submarine boom deck remains in its original position, except that it's lying down on the bottom, covered with sediment. The supporting cable was simply cut at each end, and it fell over. Some years ago, professional diver Geoffrey Edwards intersected it when excavating a trench for a north-south telecommunications cable. The boom net came ashore here at Baron Joey on this large block of sandstone. Although we knew that the end of the boom net cable was extant at Baron Joey, we had no knowledge of this large hole. Clearly, this was the easternmost pile, the absolute end of the net, except that the cable ran just a few more metres to another rock for a final fasting. We know the boom had a gate to let small craft in and out as required. It was located adjacent to Baron Joey and these three pylons. It was probably operated by winches. These rusted, rotted iron fastings are just forward of that final pile. Perhaps they secured the winch cables that raised and lowered the net to let small craft in and out as required. Thanks to Vic Ray's research, we think we now know how the pitwater boom net was constructed. Initially, two strainer posts, blue in the diagram, were positioned at Resolute and at Baron Joey, 1.35 kilometres apart. A wire was then run from pole to pole and tensioned well above the water. From it, wire tails, hangers, were dropped down to support the top of the net. The strainer took the weight of the net during construction while it was being attached to the dolphins, the pylons. Once fixed and the netting hung, the top wire of the net could be tensioned and fixed to the end eye bolts. The strainer wire was then removed. The net itself was almost precisely 1300 metres long, give or take a metre or two. Within a couple of metres of the Barra Joey hole, is another Royal Australian Navy trig point that looks to be identical to the one that's on Departure Rock over at Resolute at the other end of the Pitwater Boom. We can't get a date from this unless we can locate Bruce or Alice, but I imagine they'd be today at the very least in their 90s. Let's hope they survived the war and had a happy life together. Thanks to my very good friend Robert Sutherland and my wife Lynette too for accompanying me to find this position. It wasn't easy to get here. As for my other colleagues in this little adventure, Vic Ray, Ryan Walter, Peter Ray and Natasha Funk, it's been a pleasure to work with and alongside you in Kuringai Chase National Park. If it wasn't for the western side of Pitwater being declared a national park in 1894, we would instead have, likely as not, the Riviera Estate, a 500 lot development that would probably now be several Sydney suburbs. We should all be thankful it didn't happen. And thanks too to Jack Bluey Mercer who helped install the guns and in recent years both greatly enlivened our local history and added to it. Thanks also to Jim Macken whose passion for Pitwater and its history is responsible in part for this small film. Both men are deceased in the last few years but, like the men and women who manned Broken Section and Westhead Fortress, they may be gone, but they're not forgotten. <laughs>